going to be talking about sense of place and place-based earth science education and interpretation. And I'm going to sort of start out with sort of a disclaimer and an, an apology that uh, most of the examples here are focused on the Southwest, since that's where I've done most of my work. Um, I don't know how many people are familiar with the, the Trail of Time exhibition at Grand Canyon National Park. It's one we completed uh, back in 2010. It's a uh, we, we sort of humbly call it the world's largest interpretive geoscience exhibition because it's a four and a half kilometer long trail with a, a number of wayside panels and rock displays and uh, the brainchild of Carl Karlstrom at, at University of New Mexico and then uh, those of us were fortunate to be on the team that worked on it but uh, this is sort of an example we use on occasion. <coughs> We all use this word place, right? Everybody talks about place. It's a very common noun. It's a common <clears throat> verb when we place something. <clears throat> it may or may not be familiar uh, with you that, that there's actually a meaning for place. Okay, There's actually an official definition for place. Geographers, environmental psychologists think about places. And here's what a place is. A place is defined as any locality. Okay, it can be a real locality, can be virtual, can be an imaginary locality. Mars is a place, okay? Um, the planet Arrakis from the, the book Dune, that's, that's a place, okay? Because it's any locality that's been given meaning by human interaction. And that, was a, that came out by a, uh, Yifu Tuan, who is, who is uh, the late Yifu Tuan, a geographer at the University of, of Minnesota, and wrote a number of really classic works on the idea of place. This came from a book called Space and Place. So a place is essentially some point in space, some location in space that human beings have made meaningful. We make places, okay? Space exists independent of us, but places, we make those. Not only do we make them, but we make them collectively. So we talk about something called negotiated meaning. In other words, I think that this particular place has a certain meaning. You may think that it has a somewhat different meaning. We kind of negotiate what that meaning ends up being in the case of, of say, a, a national park. All right, now, <clears throat> if I had, sometimes I give this presentation, I have like 45 minutes to work with, and I actually call on people. What I'd like you to do is, all of you, there are places that are meaningful or important to you. And I want you to just think about one for a moment. Just, first one that comes to mind, some place that's really meaningful to you, so that's really important to you. Everybody sort of have that, can you visualize that place now, it's in your head? Now think about why it's meaningful or important to you. What, what makes it that way? And again, when I have a 45 minute time window to do presentations, I like to actually call on people and actually give me some of their examples. But I don't want to do that now. We will have time to do this sort of thing later. But, but how many of you have found these places meaningful because they have some kind of scientific or historical or intellectual significance? There's something really important for that reason. Okay, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the really, it's, it's like one of the best geologic localities for X, or it's a place where so-and-so fought a battle, that sort of thing. How about emotional connections? How many of you have emotional connections to these places? Yeah, see, that's important too, okay? That's, it's, you know, where I proposed to my wife, let's say, or where I met so-and-so, or where I went to school, or where I played golf, or that, that sort of thing. Right, basically, there are these two capacities that we endow places with. The first one are meanings, okay? The intellectual ideas, why it is the way it is, whether it's a, a scientific significance, historical significance, cultural significance. We call those place meanings. And every place is, is essentially made a place by the meanings that we, we bestow upon it. But at the same time, as human beings, we cannot help but form emotional attachments to those meaningful places. And emotional attachments, it's interesting because there's an entire spectrum that runs from essentially being totally oblivious to the existence of a place all the way to being willing to make significant personal sacrifices for the benefit of that place, which could be physical sacrifices, fiscal sacrifices. You know, you talk about people who are willing to give their lives or give their livelihoods. That's sort of the extreme end of place attachments. Now, if we take that entire, for any given place, like, for example, the Shenandoah Valley. We take all of the meanings that people have imbued in that place and all the place attachments, we put them together. That's what we call sense of place. Sense of place is a set of place meanings and place attachments for a given place. And so we as human beings, we possess the sense of place. The place exists. It's we who have the sense of that place. And that place, again, is the, the idea of sense of place, this is an idea that actually comes out of environmental psychology and geography theory. You could actually find 
books and papers written about what sense of place is and how we measure it. Okay, we can actually, this is the cool thing, is we can quantitatively, in other words, we can actually use surveys, we can actually calculate scores, calculate numerical values, or qualitatively, we can watch what people do in a place, or we can ask them questions, or we can ask them to write about their experiences, or make drawings, or make sketches. We can test and characterize this idea of sense of place. It actually is a real construct that we can work with in our teaching and our interpretation. So the sense of place encapsulates our connection to places. And we can talk about individual sense of place, we can talk about a collective sense of place, okay, but that's what this means. It's meanings and attachments, meanings and attachments. Nothing more complicated than that. Whoops, sorry. <clears throat> but the thing about it is that, that if it's a place where a lot of people find meaning and have many, many attachments, that we can say that the senses of a place that people form are as diverse as, as the, the total number of people who have ever experienced or interacted with that place. And I use Grand Canyon as an example because Grand Canyon has so many different kinds of meanings for people. To a geologist, a geologist looks at Grand Canyon and starts to think in terms of geologic maps and cross sections. We have all these beautiful old uh, basement rocks and sedimentary rocks. So it, it's a geologic, geologically spectacular location for that reason. But it's also a national park, right? It's a venue for public education. It's a venue for interpretation and not just about geology, also about history and culture and ecology and botany and zoology and so on. And so we have interpretive rangers who give presentations. <clears throat> but the Grand Canyon is also the indigenous homeland for about 22 different tribes in the Southwest. Okay, It is home. It is sacred. It has significant meaning for indigenous people in that area. It also has great historical meaning. There's John Wesley Powell. You know, the, sort of his name is forever associated with the exploration of the Grand Canyon. It's an area where recreation goes on in all different forms. And it's an area that has been controversial because there have always been proposals to develop resources at or near the boundaries of Grand Canyon National Park. The most recent debate being whether there should be uranium mining or not just north of the north rim of the Grand Canyon. So all of these constitute diverse meanings, okay? Like for example, somebody whose meaning for Grand Canyon sort of resides in this area is probably going to be fairly diametrically opposed to somebody who sees the Grand Canyon as a potential place to extract uranium in the future. Okay, and we have to take that into consideration when we're teaching about or interpreting a place that we have these diverse place meanings. And geoscientists, we have to remember that just because to us a place might be most important in a geological sense, that may not be the case for the people that we're trying to excite about the place, or the people we're trying to teach about the place. They may have very, very different sets of meanings and attachments. Their sense of place may be very different from ours. Not to say that one is more valid than the other, but we have to acknowledge that they can be different. All right, and it's important to any kind of person, whether it's an interpreter or a formal educator who teaches earth science, because we teach earth science and other natural sciences in and by means of places. We use places as the, as the platforms, as the settings to do our teaching. Okay, Edward Casey, he's a professor of philosophy at the uh, Stony Brook University of New York, probably the greatest living scholar of sort of the theoretical idea of what places are. He came to ASU and gave a talk, and we started, I started engaging him in a conversation. He's one of my heroes. He's a great, great guy. I started engaging him in a conversation about the idea of place in earth science teaching, you know, why, why it's so important to understand this idea of sense of place and what place is. And this is what he said. He said, well, of course it is, because our access to space and time is how they happen in a given place. We, don't, we teach about earth science using real places. It's not theoretical, right? We're talking about Shenandoah Valley. We're talking about Massanut Mountain. We're talking about real places, all right? And now, it looks like this kind of got cut off, but this is a quote by uh, Greg Cajete, who is a uh, Native American uh, specialist in, in science education at the University of New Mexico. And you can see the quote here, the first way of thinking and knowing has to do with one's physical place. What he's talking about there is that indigenous ways of teaching and learning are fundamentally place-based. <laughs>